Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day to day, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the horrific murder of 57 year old Denise Hollowell. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. Now, before I get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a huge thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Aura. And I want to start this off with a question for you, and that is this. Have you ever Googled your name or the name of somebody you loved, you know, somebody you were interested in, and been able to find all of their personal information or all of your personal information on one of those public listing sites? Because when I tell you, it is far more common than any of us would like to think for your private information to get out there for anyone to see. And that is because there are these things out there called data brokers that take your private information and sell it to people. They sell it, they make money off of this and they give it to people that you really will not give it. They sell it to people who you really don't want to have it like spammers and robocallers. And they can even find out where you live. Okay. I am not down with that sickness. I value my privacy and I value your privacy. And that is why I want to introduce you to Aura. Now, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Here's the good news. Did you know that data brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to do so? Sounds great, right? Well, obviously there's a catch here because they make it super hard to figure out who has your information. And that is where Aura comes in. Aura identifies which of those pesky data brokers have your information and they submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They do the work so you do not have to. When I first signed up for Aura, the very first thing I did is I went to the data broker opt out section because I was just curious. I was like, how many could really have my information and be out there selling it to God knows who. And I'll tell you, it was over 30, over 30 of them. And I was happy to see right away that Aura had already submitted opt out requests on my behalf. I was like, thank you for that because this is ridiculous. And that's not all they do for you. They also check to make sure your information has not been leaked on the dark web and nobody wants their information leaked on the dark web. And they check to see if like your passwords that you use for important sites, like, I don't know, your online banking, they check to see if those passwords are strong and secure. And it turns out that mine are. And I was very happy to know that because I am one of those people who does not change my passwords very often. And I've had the same one on most accounts since 2007. And it turns out I chose right the first time because they're still going strong. And all of that that I've just told you, all of those examples I just gave you are just some of the things that Aura does to protect you and your family from online threats that you just simply cannot see. Through just the Aura app, which is super easy to set up, you can get things like parental controls, which I'm going to be needing sooner and sooner. I can't believe my baby is almost two. They also have things like antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. And you get it all in one place. You don't need several different apps for these things. And you get it all at one very affordable price. Now listen, it sounds like a great deal to me, but I know I'm not your mom and I can't tell you what to do. But what I can tell you is I don't want people to exploit you and profit off of your personal information. And you don't have to let that happen. You can let Aura help keep you safe online. And of course, I have good news in regards to that. Aura is offering members of the Brat Pack the opportunity to explore all they have to offer for free for two weeks through my link. So if all of that sounds as good to you as it does to me, make sure to click the link in my description box to let them know that I sent you, which is aura.com slash Bratterstein, to get a 14-day free trial and see if anyone online has leaked your personal information. And if they have, let Aura help you put a stop to it today. Now I just want to say a big thank you to Aura for sponsoring today's video and for being such a good sponsor to this channel. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors because without them, like I couldn't, you know, put out videos as consistently as I do. You rock. Don't ever change. All right, with all that said, let's go ahead and get into this video. Now this video is on a case that was recommended to me by a member of the Brat Pack named Jessica. Hi, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. And this is a like hometown case for her. This is somebody who was 
tragically murdered in, you know, an area that is close to her. So it affected her more personally because when something that tragic happens so close to you and in like a smaller area, it sends ripple effects through the community as we know. And this case happened like right before COVID. So the coverage on it is less than I think it merits because this case is horrific and it has so many layers to it from Denise's reputation and standing in the community that she had at the time she was killed because of a previous arrest to the person who killed her to their reasons or justifications for why they killed her to the absolutely brutal way that she was killed. There is just so much to this case. It is truly the stuff of nightmares. And today I'm going to tell you that entire story. I'm going to tell you this nightmare story. I read all the things that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details. But obviously I want you to answer once you have something to go on. So at the end, but the question today is this, how am I going to ask this without giving too much information away? Okay. What, what do you believe was the true motive for Denise's murder? Do you believe, or do you understand this person's motivation for what they did? Or do you think that it was not true what they were saying? And it was just pure selfishness on their part. All this will make more sense once we get through the video, but let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through all the details of the case. And now with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Denise Hollowell. Our story today begins on the evening of July 13th, 2019. And this was in a place called Inverness, which is a city in Florida. And it's on this day that a call came into 911 that led police to a home located at 4419 South Dodge Point, which was off of Old Floral City Road. The call was coming from a frantic 17 year old boy named Carlos who said his mother needed help and needed help now. He then told the operator that he woke up from a nap to find his mother attacked in her bed with an ax embedded into the back of her skull. But he said that she was still breathing. He is just totally freaking out and the operator's doing everything they can to keep him calm, to get him to go out of the house because they want to make sure he's safe. They don't know if there's still danger in the home. And of course, officers are dispatched to the scene. They get there, they go inside with guns drawn because they don't know if there's somebody still inside. But as they move through the house going room for room, they find that there is no one else in the house except for in one bedroom. Inside this bedroom, lying in her bed, is Denise Hollowell, and she is in terrible shape. As I said, she had an ax embedded into the back of her head, and it was so deep in there that only like an inch of the blade was outside of her head. But despite this, first responders did attempt to do CPR on her. They actually had to do it while she was on her side because they couldn't roll her over onto her back because of the ax. But unfortunately, Denise could not be saved, and she was pronounced dead that evening. Police are stunned. They cannot understand why somebody would break into this house to murder this woman out, out in the middle of nowhere, because it really was like out there by the lake. She had a couple of neighbors, but the neighbors that were there were also Denise's friends. So it didn't make sense. And Carlos said much of the same. He said he had no idea who would do this to his mother. All of the people around were like friends or people that she knew from church. So it didn't make sense to him either that somebody would do this to her because by all accounts or by most accounts, Denise was a great person. So with that, let's talk about her. Let's talk about Denise because who she was and her past does lead us to one of the first people that people who knew her suspected when they heard that she was killed. So Denise, to those who knew Denise, like everyone who talked about her said that she was just a fantastic person, a good person through and through whose generosity and kindness inspired those who came in contact with her. She was the type of person with a warm heart and a big smile and a woman with an infectious laugh who loved big and hard and was very committed to those she loved like friends or family. She was always there for them. In her personal life, she had been married twice, but neither of those relationships had, you know, worked out in the long run, but she did get a chance to share at least some of her adventurous personality with one of these men, I guess, because I heard, because there was an episode of Dateline, I think it was, where there was an interview with a friend of hers who said that one of these men 
they exchanged their vows to each other while skydiving, which just shows the type of person she was because that is brave. And to that, I say no. That's going to be a no for me, but I'm glad that she found somebody who had that adventurous spirit in them as well, even if it didn't last. As Denise got older, her whole life was teaching church and spending time like weekends and, you know, vacations at this lake house that Denise's family had owned for three generations. It was right next door to a woman who Denise had known like her entire life. I guess Denise's family and this lady's name was Amy. I guess Denise's family and Amy's family owned adjacent lots. So Denise and Amy like grew up adjacent to each other, just like the lots. They were around each other all the time and they stayed friends from the time they were kids until the time they were adults because they had, you know, known each other their whole lives. Denise had worked as a vet tech while working on getting her teaching credentials, which led her to getting a job as a teacher. And she was said to be a great teacher. Her students were said to have loved her. And in addition to her role as a teacher, she was also a well-known community figure, like a figure in her community. She was very committed to the area she lived in and would volunteer with local charities or organizing fundraisers fundraisers. So, you know, she did plenty of things to enrich the lives of those around her. But in her own life, though she was happy, there was a puzzle piece that was just missing within her. Denise wanted to be a mother and she had been in these relationships and they hadn't worked out. So that just hadn't really happened for her. But she knew that something that she truly wanted was kids. And since she was not in a relationship at this time, and she was a little bit older, her options for having like, you know, a natural childbirth were a little bit limited at this point. So she knew that she wanted to adopt. And it wasn't just that her options were limited that made her want to adopt. It's that she also had a softness in her heart for adopting because she herself was adopted. And she knew what a joy it could be for a child to be chosen. You know what I mean? Like I went out and I specifically chose you because I want you. And she knew that she had the ability to give this child the life that they deserve to have. So she wanted to do that. So Denise started looking into adoption agencies and she started looking specifically into adoption agencies that had children from Central America, which led her to meeting an adorable little boy from Guatemala. This was Carlos, her son Carlos from the beginning, and they were just immediately inseparable. Apparently she fell in love with him from the very first hug. So she's like, yep, this one, I'm going to be taking this little boy home with me. And you know what's super cute about this is that Carlos and Amy's kids, who were also adopted, by the way, which Amy was Denise's friend who lived next door, uh, Carlos and Amy's kids started playing together and like having that same childhood experience that Amy and Denise had had together growing up in the same area. And I just thought that that was very cute to picture, picture in the lake. And I'm just picturing, you know, like kids running around in like the forest and swinging on swings into water and just doing cute shit that I can't relate to because I live in, you know, Southern California and Los Angeles, but it just sounds very precious and very pure. And to be doing the same thing that your mothers did when they were kids is very sweet. And it started with them just doing it on the weekends because she, you know, would just go on the weekends. But then eventually Carlos and Denise moved into the lake house full time. So it was happening all the time. Denise and Carlos, by all accounts, had a charmed life. They were a very happy duo. And Denise loved this kid, even having his name tattooed on her ankle. It was exactly the type of kid that a parent would want and grew into the exact type of teenager that a parent would want. He excelled at school. He was super smart, even skipping a grade. He was great at sports. He was great socially. He was very popular amongst other kids. He had a girlfriend who really liked him and whose parents thought he was a good match, a very mature young man. Everyone loved him, especially his mother. They were just said to have an incredibly close bond, a bond that Denise's friend Amy was actually jealous of because she was having trouble forming that bond with her girls who were, you know, I don't know if they were the same age, but they were close enough in age that it was relatable. Now I went through all of this to give you the backstory and tell you how close the two were to explain the next portion here. And it's because Denise loved Carlos so much that she wanted him to have everything that he wanted in life, right? So even though Denise herself wasn't super interested in having additional children, like that wasn't a dream for her. She had Carlos and she was fine. She did want him to have everything he wanted. She wanted him to experience all life had to offer, you know, out there that she could, you know, 
realistically give. And so she thought that he may be happier with a sibling. And because of that, she actually did adopt another child. She adopted a young boy from Honduras who was eight years old at the time he was adopted. And his name was Angel. And he was going to be Carlos's little brother. Now, this is where things are going to take like a sad departure because things with Angel did not go the way, you know, she and Carlos had hoped in their mind. And in 2015, which was a couple of years before Denise was killed, she actually had to call the police and report Angel missing because he ran away. So police came, they made a report, they all started searching. And I guess it was actually Denise who recovered Angel hiding in a neighbor's shed. Now that sounds great. You found the kid, you know, he's safe. That's great. But this is where things get a little complicated and a little bit darker. So in the midst of this happening, police had come into Denise's home and searched the home. And when they searched the home, they had some concerns because they had gone into Angel's room and what they saw made them feel like something was wrong here because his room was basically empty. He was 12 years old by this time. So you would think he'd have, you know, toys, stuff on the wall, something, but no, it was basically completely empty. All there was in the room was like an air mattress on a frame, a bucket, that was to be used as a toilet. The window was nailed shut and there were actually locks on the outside of the door to lock the boy in. So naturally at the time this made police go like, what the fuck? And now that Angel was back, of course, they wanted to question him and find out what that was all about. This is when Angel told police that he was a horribly abused child. He said that every night he would be locked in his room when he'd go to sleep. He said that he wouldn't be allowed out of his room except for to do chores during the day. And when he was allowed out of the room to do chores, he was made to do them naked. And he said that he would be beaten and not just by Denise, but Carlos as well. And he said that they would beat him in his groin with their fists. Like it was so bad that officers who looked into this particular case of child abuse said that it was one of the worst cases they had ever seen. So Denise was arrested, obviously, because these are very serious allegations and the kids were taken from her custody. But Carlos, even though he was taken from the custody, did try to bail his mom out. He even went to like a bail bondsman and tried to, you know, get money to get her out of jail. But it ended up not mattering because Denise's attorney was able to convince the judge to let her out on like house arrest with an ankle monitor. But dude, at the time that this happened in the area, it was huge because this was a teacher and a mother, a mother and a teacher, a teacher of children who was being accused of child abuse. At the time that this happened, she was teaching science and social studies at a charter school. And before that, she had worked at a middle school and an elementary school and was said to have a clean teaching record. Needless to say, though, even though she was released from jail, she wasn't able to go back to work. She was put on um, administrative leave, though it was, was paid administrative leave. That's a hard word sentence for me. Paid administrative leave while they, you know, concluded and went through their investigation because you, you can't trust her to go back to school if people are saying that she's abusive. And the principal came out and was like, I don't, I don't know what to say about this man. Like she was a reliable teacher who seemed to get along with her students. I guess you just never know what goes on behind closed doors. But that was really bad for her because she couldn't work, right? She couldn't work. So she wasn't making money. So her credit card bills got run up. So her credit was ruined. And because her reputation was so at this point, her life was basically ruined, which is like, if it was true, that's what you deserve. Don't abuse kids. But there's a gray area there, which is what we're going to get into. So this all happened. She got arrested. She got released on bail. She wasn't able to work. She lost her kids. All of that happened. And it all happened on mostly Angel's word that this had happened to him. But once an investigation started and police really started digging into it and looking into it and the history and everything, it started to look like it may not be true because there was no evidence to prove that any of this was true. They spoke to him and she told them that yes, she did spank him. She admitted that she did spank him, but that that was the extent of the physical punishment. And I guess that in itself is a gray area on whether or not that is abuse. I'm not going to get like into a whole parenting thing. Cause I know people feel very, um, it's one of those things that could probably bring some negative comments. If you disagree with somebody's parenting choices, I will say, uh, it's not something I would do personally. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not going to spank my child. Like that's not something I'm interested in, but the question here is whether or not it was criminal. And that was kind of, you know, 
what they were looking into. She said that the reason the boy's window was nailed shut, which was like, mm, that's kind of weird, is because he had a tendency to run away. He would always sneak out of the house, so she had to start nailing his window shut to stop him from doing that. And she said in hindsight, the locks on the outside of the door to lock him in might have been a mistake, but she felt like she was running out of options. She had spoke to doctors and she had spoke to her local pastor and nothing she was doing had been working. She said that Angel had serious behavioral and anger issues, and that is why he had nothing in his room, nothing up on the walls, because when he had had things in there, he had just destroyed them. And he said the reason there was, or excuse me, and she said the reason he had a bucket in his room wasn't because he was expected to only use the bucket. It was there in case he couldn't make it to the bathroom in the middle of the night. She said that she felt helpless and responsible for her child and was just doing everything in her power that she felt she had to do to make sure that he was safe from hurting himself and that he didn't hurt anyone else. And the thing about Denise is this is just her saying this, right? Which we, do you believe her? That's the question. But the thing is, is she was taking notes. She had take, taken notes on this behavior for three years. She had been trying to manage him and write things down so that she could talk to the doctor, talk to the pastor, figure out what to do. And she said, like, after, she was like, I tried to give this to police right from the beginning to show them, like, this is something that's ongoing, but they just ignored it and wouldn't take it. And it wasn't just Denise who said this either. They spoke to Denise's older son, Carlos, and Carlos said, like, corroborated everything his mom said and explained why the house was the way it was. He said Angel couldn't have nice things in his room because he would destroy them. He would break them or he would even break windows. And he said that Angel was locked in his room because he would try to run away and that Denise wasn't the one that was abusive. Angel was abusive, that Angel would hit them and sometimes even beat on their dogs. So all of that, all of that information was already making those in charge wonder if arresting Denise had been a mistake and there was nothing here. But it became more apparent after she was arrested that that probably was the case because remember how I said that both boys went into foster care? Well, when Angel was in foster care, it became more apparent. Apparently that's the word of the day. Oh my gosh, I did it again. I didn't even mean to do that. While in foster care, it was reported that Angel had had, he had had, in fact, behavioral issues. Apparently he had aggressive and violent outbursts with his foster parents. He hit his foster father and told his foster father, like, if you didn't do what I wanted to do, he was going to accuse him of child abuse, just like he had done with his mother, Denise. And it got to the point that like none of his foster parents, cause he got moved around, none of them wanted to keep him in their house because of the way he acted. And in the end, because of this, because of all of the stuff that I've told you, and it wasn't just them, there were also teachers, there were a lot of people that corroborated that Angel just had behavioral issues. All of the charges against Denise were dropped. I actually don't even think they went through with actually charging her. I'm not sure how that works. That's what her attorney was saying, but her record was cleared. There was nothing against her because they didn't believe that Denise had done the things that Angel had accused her of doing. Now, after all of this happened, Denise did come out and she made a statement trying to, you know, set the record straight and like reclaim her reputation. Cause this is kind of a difficult thing to come back from. And she told them like, she was innocent. None of this had happened. And sometimes things are not how they seem. And man, I can't see that being especially helpful, maybe for some people. I just feel like once you have allegations like that against you, that's a bell you can't unring. So it had to have been difficult for her. And I know that after this, it took her like a year to get another teaching job. She did though. She ended up getting a teaching job where she was teaching children or was it adults? People who were autistic and she was flourishing in this job. But before that, before she got the job and was flourishing, she was struggling. She had went through all of this and she still didn't have her kids back and she wanted her boys back. She was like, I am their forever mom and they need their forever home. And she was said to be like a great mother to them. She was the kind of mom that was like very on top of things, was always going to their, you know, sporting events, took them on vacations. She was very attentive and very involved in their lives. She loved them and she was their mother. In the end though, in this is sad because, you know, depending on what you think about Denise, this would be very hard for somebody if she really, really did love this child, but she only got Carlos back. Angel was evaluated and it was determined by professionals that like, I think legally she could have taken him back, but they were like for him. Like if you want him to do well and you want him to flourish, being back in this home after everything that's happened is not going to be the best for him. So because of that, she did sign away her parental rights and he was put back into foster care. And from that time, like on, she would not talk about Angel at all. It was just too painful for her. 
Now, I tell you all of that backstory because one, you know, it's part of Denise's story and it shows, you know, the evolution of the household. And two, because once Denise was found murdered, the rumors and speculation amongst the community started to swirl. And people believed that there was a good chance that the person responsible for her murder could have been her estranged son, Angel, because it had been so tense. There had been this legal paddle. It wasn't like a far reach to think that he could have come back in his anger and killed Denise. But the problem with this theory was the fact that when police looked into Angel, because they did, obviously, this isn't like out of nowhere, this is something to look into. They found that at the time that Denise had been murdered, he was actually in juvie, so he couldn't be responsible. So police had already been like, really going hard trying to figure out what happened here. Because if this was a stranger who broke into this house and killed Denise, that meant there was a, a literal ax murderer out by the lake. You know what I mean? And that's horrifying. So they really went in, they had people searching on land, on water, in the air, like the entire, they had dogs out there. The entire area was saturated with like people searching and police were going to neighbors being like, who do you think could have done this? What do you think could have happened? Once Angel had been ruled out, neighbors wondered if perhaps Denise had been targeted specifically for some reason, because some weird stuff had begun happening in the area. First, they started noticing that there were a lot of weird cars like coming and going from the area. There was a mysterious house fire at Denise's house that the origin was never, you know, discovered. The origin of this fire was never discovered. Neighbors had found their pets going missing or some of them just dying. One lady said that her cat was like cut in half. And Carlos and Denise too had been worried about intruders. That's why they had actually put up signs outside their property saying that they were like being recorded and stay out. And a camera, like an outdoor camera had been installed. But all of this was just rabbit trails and speculation because by this time, honestly, from day one, police already had somebody in their crosshairs. They had somebody that they believed was responsible for Denise's murder. Do you have any idea who police thought this was? If you said Denise's son, the boy she adopted from Guatemala when he was four years old, Carlos, you'd be correct. Police believed that Carlos had murdered his own mother. So with that, let's go back to that day when he called 911 after finding his mother and police arrived at the house. Police get there. They find Denise. She's pronounced dead at the scene. Carlos, who was kept outside, is freaking out. But since he is the only person who was home at the time that this happened, they took him to the station to question him to try to find out what he might have seen, what he might have heard. And they start by just asking him what happened, like what happened that day. Carlos said that it had been mostly a totally normal day. He said he and his mom had gotten up early in the day and they had actually gone to the funeral of a family friend that was about an hour and a half away. And that then they came home and on the way they stopped at like this pie shop that they loved, they each got a pie and they came home. They spent some time together. They sat at the table and they ate their pie right out of the box to save some dishes. And then they decided to go their separate ways um, into their rooms and have their naps. This was something that they did during the day. They would take a couple of hours away from each other to give each other like their me time. And usually they would take naps. So she went in her room, closed the door to take her nap. He went in his room to close his door. He closed his door, went in his room to take his nap. He says he, you know, laid in bed, watched some YouTube videos before finally falling asleep. And he said at some point he woke up during that nap, sent some texts and went back to sleep. At first, he said he didn't hear anything, that she went in her room, he went in his room, there was background noise, there was nothing. But when pressed, he said that maybe she left her room to get some water and then went back in, but he couldn't be sure, but that was something she normally did. And said if she was to like leave the room again or to leave the house, he probably wouldn't have heard it because one, there was background noise, and two, the garage where the car was, was like in a different area, so he wouldn't have heard it. He told police that he woke up from his nap to the sounds of dogs barking near his side of the house. And that was weird because they were usually kept in like another area. So to hear them barking here was strange. So he got up and when he got up and went out, he saw that the front door was wide open and he thought that maybe his mom left the door open because she would go and let the dogs out and then like close the door usually. But he thought, oh, maybe she just didn't close the door. That's weird. So he says he went out to try to get the dogs because they were barking. He didn't want them to bark, but he wasn't able to get them. So he went inside to get his mother to help him. And that's when he found her body. He said that when he walked in her room, he saw her laying there with the ax in the side of her skull. 
Those were his words, an ax in the side of her skull. And he said that he could hear her trying to breathe. He said he didn't really know what to do to try to help her because like he hadn't been in that situation. He said he kind of shook her, but she was unresponsive except for the sound of her trying to breathe. And he said he didn't want to do anything stupid that would make things worse, like pull out the ax and have her bleed to death. So he didn't try to render any aid. When police asked Carlos, like, who do you think could have done this to your mother? He said he had no idea that his mom had no enemies, that the only people she really knew were like close friends that she'd had forever or people from church. So it didn't make any sense because they lived out in the middle of nowhere and they didn't bother anyone. He told the cops during this interview that he and his mother had been through a lot together and there was nothing he wouldn't do for her. But police are already like, side-eyeing him a bit. They don't believe him. They don't believe that his story makes any sense at all because they said that because of the depth at which the ax had been in Denise's head, that they believed it wouldn't be possible that she would have still been breathing when he found her. Though I'm not sure if that is true because I think I read that she was still breathing when police, not police, well, yeah, police and paramedics got there. But at the time that they're interviewing him, this isn't lining up to them. So they're tr thinking in their head that he might be responsible. Almost an hour into the interrogation, the police leave the room. And when they come back, they press him harder because they've gotten some new information. They've formed a more full-fledged picture. What did I just say? Basically, they had looked into the dynamic between Carlos and Denise and been like, hmm, things weren't great here. And they were already sort of suspecting him anyway, right? Because there was no sign of forced entry and the intruder theory was just incredibly far-fetched to begin with. They tell him like, listen, we know you and your mom didn't have a great relationship. We know that just months ago, the cops were called after you assaulted your mother and gave her a concussion and broke her arm. So what's that about? He said that that was taken out of context, that the two had talked and resolved it, but that they had been, you know, arguing and sort of pushing each other, like, you know, get out of my face, get out of my face. And he said that that was common. He said that he and his mom would fight. And that's when he switched his narrative and said that she was abusive to him, saying that she would hit him in the face, the head, the back, whatever she could reach with whatever she could reach. He said after this altercation with his mom, he actually had moved out of her house. He said that he was in a bad spot mentally. People who knew him at this time said that he was so anxious and tense that you could feel it. And it was at this time that he started using drugs more heavily and reportedly even tried to take his own life. He ended up going to the doctor at this point and he was put on medication for depression. And I believe for bipolar disorder as well. Depression, I know for sure. Bipolar, I'm a little iffy on. And reportedly this medication helped him tremendously. He was doing a lot better. And it was said that after this, after he did some work on himself, after he got his mood stabilized, that him and his mom patched things up and he just had just moved back into his mom's home. And I say that he was able to patch things up with his mom and move back home. But by patch things up, I mean that she agreed to a list of his demands. He like gave her a list of demands, things like she would get him a reliable car that he could use for college that she wouldn't take back from him. And that after he turned 18, she would still, you know, financially contribute towards his college education. He wanted her to like sign this and notarize this. It was a huge thing. And I guess that's because he didn't feel like he could depend on her um, to keep her promises since they had such a rocky relationship. And he had started like moving out and moving back in and da, 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 you know, at like 16 years old. But even though she let him move back in, and I guess she didn't let him, I guess she really wanted him to move back in. And she'd been asking him to come back. She was still scared of him. She was afraid of what he might do. So she actually put up cameras around the house, like a couple of cameras around the house just to monitor things. Cause she was scared. And I guess she was so scared that she even told her friend, Amy, that if anything happened to her, she wanted Amy to look after her dogs. So anyways, during the interrogation, the cop ends up looking at him. It's just like, what do you think the odds are that a stranger would break into somebody's house and murder them with an ax? Like, what do you think the odds of that are? And Carlos's response is interesting. He immediately is like, you know, I don't know what the odds are, but I hope you're not insinuating that I did this because me and my mother have been there for each other through everything. And I would never, I would never hurt my mother. And then he made sure to tell the officer that he was offended by even the suggestion. The officer then looks at him and he has a very interesting approach here, but he looks at him and he's like, listen, I remember you. 
I remember dealing with you when you were here last time after you, you know, assaulted your mother. You acted like a sociopath then, and you're acting like a sociopath now. He's like, you're putting on a real show. You're trying to act like you're so upset and like you feel all of these emotions, but sociopaths do not feel emotions the way other people do. Carlos seemed a little stunned by this and like was like, are you calling me a sociopath? And the cop was like, yeah, I think that's what I just said as I called you a sociopath. You don't have normal feelings. And Carlos was like, um, first off, you're wrong. Not a sociopath. I do have normal feelings. I loved my mother. You can ask anyone in this county and they will tell you the same thing. Carlos though, man, he does not break. They try, obviously they're trying to get to him, but he does not break. And since at this time they don't have anything to arrest him on, like they don't have evidence against him. They just have their belief. They have to let him go. And he was released to DCF at this point, because remember he's only 17 when this is happening. So the DCF workers first tried to take Carlos to his girlfriend's house to see if he could stay there. When they got there though, her parents were like, mm, I don't know. I don't think so because like you're both teenagers and your hormones are crazy. And I, that's going to be a no from me. And eventually though, which is wild because they used to love him after some time went on and like things started to look a little weird. They actually started keeping his girlfriend away from him because they just felt weird about the whole situation. And it wasn't just Carlos's girlfriend and her parents, Carlos's friends, several of his friends started to distance themselves from him as time went on because the stories he would tell things just weren't lining up and people were starting to suspect he was involved. One of his friends was so sketched out by the whole thing that she started recording their conversations. But anyway, since he couldn't stay with his girlfriend, the next person on the list of people to see if he could stay with was Denise's friend, Amy, the same friend that she asked to take care of her dogs. If anything happened to her, the same friend she had known forever. And poor Amy, man, she was so devastated to learn what happened to Denise. I guess that morning she saw like helicopters circling over and was worried, but had no real idea what was going on. Didn't know her friend was related to it at all. But then another neighbor called her and was like, dude, did you see what happened? There are all these police cars and forensic units at Denise's house. And it was shortly after that, that she learned her good old friend was gone. And she said of this moment, quote, I felt my knees buckle and I had to hold on to the post. And it was just a blur after that. We always planned to be, to grow old together at the lake. That didn't happen. And Amy, she did the best she could with, with Carlos, right? Like being what you want your friend to be. If something was to happen to you and they were taking care of your kid, she was doing that. She was trying to keep him busy, to keep him level headed while they were both, while they both should have been seriously grieving this horrible loss. She helped him like plan his mother's funeral to keep him busy. And during this time he like posted online about his mother being gone and about her memorial service. And he received a lot of sympathy from people who, you know, didn't suspect him. But for Amy, the whole time she felt weird about him. She was one of the people that suspected him. She said that she felt at that time he may be responsible for what happened to Denise. She said that though Denise denied it to her, she knew that Carlos had hurt her on purpose and had broken her arm on purpose. And she said that she knew that he did it then and that she suspected he may have been responsible for killing her. Now she was so worried about it that she kept wasp spray next to her bed at night because she thought he may come in and hurt her also. And she felt really guilty about feeling like this because she didn't know she just suspected. And there was a good chance that he wasn't responsible and he was just a young boy who just lost his mother to murder and found her body. But deep inside of her, she felt like something was off because he wasn't acting the way she thought he should act. He wasn't grieving. He didn't even seem sad about his only parents death and not just death, but horrific murder. He wasn't grieving from what she could tell. He didn't seem sad. He seemed more excited about getting her assets than sad about her being dead. He said like, it sucked that she was gone, but he was happy. He was going to get her land and her cars, shit like that. But what's weird to me is despite this, despite outwardly not seeming like he cared to others, he at this time was also writing in his journals and in his journals, he did seem to care. He wrote about her and he wrote things like, please mom, come back to me, please. And he wrote about how he'll never be able to get the vision of what he saw and what he heard out of his head, her laying there perfectly still. He is a very interesting person to me because the way he speaks seems so hollow, but his words seem like words of somebody who cares. It's just, it's very odd to me. He's very difficult for me to read is what it comes down to. 
Anyways, nine weeks later, police bring Carlos in for an additional interview. And I have to imagine at this time that Carlos knew he was screwed even more than he had already known he was screwed. Because I feel like after being called a sociopath and like being pushed that hard, if you were guilty, you had to be like, fuck, they like, no, I'm guilty. And I'm, the writing is on the wall. It's just a matter of time. But at this time, they start questioning him. They start questioning him about that day and about the 911 call and about where he was at the time he made the 911 call. And he tells them that he was in the room with his mother and that he didn't go outside at all. Right. And then shortly after that, they're like, well, here's the thing. We know that that's bullshit because we've looked at your GPS and we can see every step you made during the time that you say you were sleeping, your mother was killed all that we can we can literally see where you were in the house they tell him that they know he was outside in the yard by the lake when he made the 911 call and he tries to deny it he says he could see the lake from where he was but he wasn't outside near the lake and they're saying all of this because they're leading him they're leading him to the fact that they have already had divers out there and they already searched the lake and they already found some stuff which is wild because to look at this lake you would think it would be impossible to see or find anything but apparently once you go down just a little bit there is better visibility i don't know but the point is they did go in to the lake and they did find some stuff. The officer pulls out this box to show Carlos the stuff that they found and what they found were cameras from inside the house and his mother's cell phone. Now unfortunately they weren't able to get any information that was useful off of these devices though they tried. They had been in the water it was hard. They even brought in secret service to try to get information off but they weren't able to get anything. But Carlos didn't know that yet. He didn't know that there was nothing on there for them to find and see. Now I can only imagine what this was like for Carlos because he had already told investigators that there were no working cameras inside the house. He said there was just the broken one outside, but police already knew that wasn't true because they had been inside the house and they had seen that like one, there was dust, right? Like undisturbed dust everywhere, except for in certain places where there was like empty spots that looked like a camera might fit. And also there were like cables to hook up the camera, just like hanging around, but no cameras. So they were like, we already kind of knew it, but now we have them and they're right here in front of you. Look, he then changes his story and he says, you know what, actually, I don't remember. I don't remember anything that happened. I just remember like getting home with my mom and then we went to bed. I don't remember anything else. And then I just remember waking up to the dogs barking and I found my mom and I was like, oh shit, this is fucked up. But I didn't know if somebody else did it or if maybe I did it. So I panicked, I grabbed the cameras, I grab her phone and I throw it in like just in case and call 911. He also learns <laughs> at this point, this interview must've been just very eye opening for him, but he learns after telling investigators that he learns that they know that that is also a lie because based on his cell phone data, which they had, they knew he had never even taken a nap. He had been using his phone the whole time. He then changes his story again. And he says, okay, I do remember a little bit. I remember being outside. I remember getting the ax. I remember sharpening the ax. And then that was it. All of a sudden it was just in the back of her head and I didn't know how it happened. It wasn't planned. It wasn't something I was going to do. It just sort of happened. And as soon as it happened, I like snapped out of it. I saw what happened. I was like, oh my God, I saw nose, nose, blood trickling out of her nose. And I knew I needed to call 911. And he said of this quote, it's been killing me, eating me up real bad. And then he told investigators that yes, he did feel better to get it off his chest, but he still felt like a piece of shit. As far as the why, he tells police that the reason that he can think of as to why he would have done this is that his mother was verbally abusive, that she often put him down, told him he was a loser, told him how disappointed she was in him. And I will be honest, I do feel like this is partially true because there has been some audio recordings released from somebody that Carlos was staying with. I guess there was like a meeting amongst people and Denise was there and Carlos was there and it was being recorded and she wasn't speaking kindly to him. She was like screaming at him and telling him like, shut up over and over when he wasn't like yelling. He wasn't raising his voice. He was just talking and she was just like screaming, shut up at him. And the friend he stayed with, this friend that recorded it, said that this behavior was typical, that Denise would put Carlos down and complain about the things he would or wouldn't do, even focusing on the damage done to a red pickup truck during a suicide attempt where he ran it into a tree instead of the fact that he may have been trying to take his own life. She was upset about the damage to the truck. This friend also said that she would, Denise, would make sure to remind Carlos that it's because of her that he has anything and that if it wasn't for her, he would... I don't like this quote, but just be one of those idiots is what they say. She said, trying to cross the border into the country. So that sucks, right? I definitely don't like it. It's hard when a victim isn't a great person or 
doesn't line up with what your beliefs of a good person are. You know what I mean? It makes it a little bit challenging and makes you feel a little bit weird. At least it does for me. But does that mean she deserved to die? Does that mean that she deserved to be sleeping in her bed when her child came in and swung an ax so hard that it went almost completely into her skull? Like this was a gruesome scene. It was so gruesome that the sheriff at the time wouldn't even tell people what her cause of death was because it was so gruesome. So even if she was like kind of shitty to him and maybe a shitty person, I don't know. I didn't know her. Does that mean she deserved to die? I, I would like to think that we would all say no, but then again, I have been surprised in the past. Like, I gotta be honest, the comments on my Betty Broderick video really um, made me realize that people have a big differing of opinions, which is fine. It was surprising, but it is fine. And it makes me really wonder what people are going to think in this situation. So make sure to let me know in the comments what you think about all this, because it's okay to have a discussion and respectfully disagree with each other respectfully. And in this case in particular, man, it's just weird because remember, Carlos was a golden child to her. The two were so incredibly close. They had a closeness that people envied. People were jealous of their good relationship. But I guess it was around the age of 11 that Carlos started like going down a weird path. He started drinking, started doing drugs like ecstasy, meth, and coke. He even started selling drugs with people thinking that he was selling them from the woods near his home, which is why neighbors saw all those weird cars around. He had once done so well in school, but now his grades had plummeted and he even ended up being kicked out of the Christian school he was attending. During his senior year, he was expelled for having weed on him from this school, but he was able to hide it. He hid it from his mother for months, but when she finally found out, that's when she was apparently crushed and realized she needed to really crack down to get her kid back on the right path. But that is when things got bad. Carlos says that he would go out into the woods and he would bring an ax and he would visualize all the things his mother would say about him or to him about his choices, his friends, the drugs, being kicked out of school, her being disappointed, everything. And he would just chop the hell out of a tree. Carlos said during the drive home from the funeral that day, him and his mom got into a fight. He told her that he wanted to go to like a trade school instead of like a four year school. And she had told him that because of his choices and that they didn't align with what she wanted for him, she wasn't going to pay for school. He said that she told him he was worthless and useless and had no credibility and was just a fucking loser. And that by the end of this conversation, he was in tears and then he killed her. So he was going to be arrested for this and his response to the idea he was going to be arrested was interesting because he was asking them like, how long do you think this is going to take? How long do you think I'm going to be here? And when he found out he was going to jail, he was like, oh, so I'm going to have a record. Like, can that be expunged? Because I have some other things that I'd really like to do in the future, like go to college. He was just so disconnected from what he did. He was literally being arrested and charged with the first degree premeditated murder of his mother. And he's like, okay, I know that's happening, but like, I'm good for college, right? It's just, it's just wild to me. I know he was young, he was 17, but it's like, sir, sir. So he was arrested, as I said, he was charged with his mother's murder, as I said, but he pled not guilty, which is something I did not yet say. And also another thing I did not yet say is that because he was, even though rather, even though he was 17 at the time of the murder, he was being tried as an adult. Now the defense did not try to say that Carlos was innocent. They instead said that he was guilty, but not of murder, of manslaughter. They said that Carlos had mental health issues and abandonment issues that stemmed from when he was young. And that in combination with Denise's aggressive and abusive parenting style made him snap. His attorney urged the jury to see that Carlos had been mentally abused by his mother. And that's why he did what he did. But the judge didn't let a lot of this be admitted at trial. There was a lot that the jury didn't hear. They didn't even hear that Carlos had previously had a brother or that she had previously been accused of child abuse. The prosecution painted the picture of a selfish kid that was going down a bad path and was frustrated at his mother for trying to keep him grounded. They said he wanted to do what he wanted to do. He wanted to drink. He wanted to do and sell drugs. He wanted to party. He wanted to go to a trade school and he wanted his mother to fund it, whether she agreed with it or not. The prosecutor said of this quote, Ms. Hallowell didn't deserve to die. And then added that Denise did anything that any mother would do. And that was do what she thought was best for her child and for her child's future. They then presented evidence to the jury that showed that this murder was premeditated. He planned it for like 30 minutes before actually doing it. He went to a locked shed, he retrieved the ax and then sat there sharpening it before ultimately killing her with it. 
The jury was sent to deliberate, and after just 90 minutes, they had come back with their decision. They had found Carlos Hollowell guilty of the murder of his mother. Now, all there was to be done at this point was for Carlos to be sentenced. Now, even though he was being tried as an adult, he was 17 at the time of the murder, so he wasn't eligible for the death penalty. So what he was facing was 40 years to life in prison. The judge had to consider 10 different factors when deciding on Carlos's sentence that included the nature of the crime, the impact the murder had on Denise's family, and how Carlos's mental state contributed to him committing the murder. The judge heard testimony from the defense and the prosecution, the prosecution pointing out that Carlos thrived under his nurturing mother's environment until Carlos chose to drink and take controlled substances. And the defense said that Carlos was influenced by an undeveloped brain. The judge ultimately concluded that Carlos was an incorrigible offender with no chance of rehabilitation. The judge said that Carlos made choices. He chose to drink. He chose to take drugs. And the judge said that him being immature at the time that this was committed had nothing to do with the fact that he did it. And he did it to his mother when she was in her most vulnerable state. He noted that this was not a sudden outburst without thought. This was a planned attack. He sat there and waited for his mother to fall asleep, all the while, quote, sharpening his axe, which is so, just such a creepy thought, really, if you think about it as a parent, like you're sitting there, you're going to sleep, and your child is in the other room, sharpening an axe, waiting for you to fall asleep so they can kill you. And the judge said that he did this because he wanted her money, her real estate, her cars, and, quote, other property. The judge also noted that experts who met with Carlos determined that he had, quote, 16 out of the 20 criteria needed to show that somebody was a psychopath. Essentially, that was not a quote because that was real messy. But basically, he had 16 out of 20 things that needed to be there for him to be considered a psychopath and said, quote, there is no rehabilitation for a psychopath. That was an actual quote. Now, Carlos did speak during his sentencing hearing. He made a statement to the court, but really he was just speaking to his mother directly, just in the court, where he said, quote, Although she's not with us, I know she's listening. Mom, I'm so very sorry. Words can't describe how I feel right now, how much I miss you, how sorry I am for what I've done, and everything I've done throughout my entire life with you. I love you so much. He also addressed the judge, saying, quote, Your Honor, the only thing I can ask is for justice for my mom and mercy for me. Ultimately, Carlos Hallowell was sentenced to life in prison. Life in prison at such a young age because he committed a very unforgivable and irreparable thing. You know what I mean? He did something that cannot be taken back. Now, I know he is going to be able to have like a sentence review after 25 years, and I believe that's in 2044. Now, his attorney did say that Carlos and he and the attorney did plan to appeal, but I haven't seen anything filed. It hasn't been that long and appeals can take a while, uh, but I haven't seen anything filed. And it seems like Carlos has accepted what he's done and maybe he won't appeal, at least based on some statements he made during an interview he gave. So Carlos sat down and he did an interview with Dateline. And in this interview, he finally spoke, you know, he finally told, you know, his story from his point of view, his experiences and where he thinks things went so wrong. He said that things with his mother were great for a while, but things really went downhill once Angel came into the house. He said his mother changed. She got more stressed out, more aggressive, and with that more abusive. And he said that having his mother arrested in front of him was very traumatizing. He said that having him and Angel taken from his mother's home was very triggering, especially as a kid who had been adopted, because he felt like he was losing his home again and like the life he knew again. He said when he was able to come back after the allegations had been cleared, things were just different. The energy between them was different. The relationship between them was different. They were distant and they just didn't have the closeness that they had had before. And then as he got older, he said his mom expected too much of him, that she expected him to contribute financially to the household. And that when he didn't, or when he fell off, or when he didn't do well in school, or when he got in with the wrong crowd, things just got worse. He said she would tell him she was disappointed in him and would tell him that if it wasn't for her, he'd be out on the streets. And he said she made sure to let him know just how much money she would spend on him. 
And he said that that was pretty much the conversation that happened um, on the way home from the funeral, the day that she was killed, that they had been talking and that she was super upset that he wasn't going to go to the type of school she wanted him to go to, even though she was offering to pay for it. She's, he said that they fought and then they got home and he had some yard work to do that required, you know, using the ax. So he got the ax, he went into the yard, he was sharpening it. And while he was doing that, he was just thinking about every shitty thing she had ever said to him. He said he was planning to chop that tree, but he never did. Instead, he went inside. He said he was just going to get a glass of water, but he didn't get the water. He instead walked into his mother's room where he saw her sleeping. And then he took the ax and he swung it as hard as he could, trying not to look at her while he did it. He has said there is no real reason why he did what he did, that nothing she did merited it. And he said that though people don't think he's remorseful because he does have this it's hard to see it with him, that he does care and he does grieve privately, that he's both sorry for what he did to her and sorry for the position he put himself in. He said he misses her, he loves her, and he wishes he didn't do what he did, but he did and he can't change it. And I think that is the real takeaway here. Carlos murdered his mother and he can't take that back. And with that, that my friends is the story of the murder of Denise Hollowell. I hope you found my telling of this case to be informative. I hope it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for hanging out and remembering Denise with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question of the day. I had a couple and these are them. Do you, what, like, okay. Why do you think that Carlos murdered his mother? Do you think he was an abused child who snapped? Do you think that he was selfish and he just wanted to do what he wanted to do and she wasn't letting him? Do you think it's a combination of the two? Do you think it even matters? Because I go back and forth a little bit. It's kind of hard for me to land on a thing. I will say that even if he was abused here, verbally abused, because I don't know if I think he was physically abused. I don't know. I still think he made a choice. I don't think that he like blacked out or was out of control. I think he made a choice to do what he did. But again, I don't know. It's hard. He's a very hard person for me to read because the thing is, as I said, he says the words and you hear him say the words and he writes the things. But when you watch him and you see him speak, it seems hollow. And those who knew him and have spoken to him said he doesn't seem to show any remorse. So it's just very confusing for me. But let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below, because I do feel like this could be a divisive case. And I'm curious to see what people think. But anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment in the comment section below, letting me know what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As this case shows, whenever you leave me a suggestion, I put your name, I put the case edition on the list and I put your name next to it so that if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my merch store and a link to my membership. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.